What's happening? Good to see you again. <laughs> you too. How you doing? Good. Let me uh, let me move around and get in some better light here, so I'm not all backlit. <laughs> yeah, just give us a background on who you are, what you do, and how you came to do it. Okay, cool. So, um, John Cox, and I teach at the University of Delaware in the Department of Art and Design. I teach a lot of photography classes, and my background was entomology and plant pathology. So I have a Bachelor of Science degree. And then through that, I picked up a camera and I started uh, photographing insects. And from there, I was pretty much hooked on photography. So about the age of uh, 23, I got out of college and I started working for a tree company, diagnosing um, diseases on trees and shrubs. And it seemed like um, all the income I generated was from killing the things that I loved. So (laughs) I wanted to switch. And so as soon as I paid off my student loan, I quit my job. I uh, had a girlfriend at the time. We broke up and uh, (laughs) had a pickup truck and I had about 300 bucks in my bank account. So then I just decided to uh, try and be a photographer. So (laughs) I started doing that, taking all sorts of just odd jobs, uh, photography jobs. And then it was right when um, Nikon released the Coolpix 990, which was this basically consumer level swivel camera. It was around a 3.5 megapixel or 2.5 meg- megapixel, you know, <laughs> top of the line. <laughs> camera. It must have been mind blowing at the time. Yeah, it was mind blowing. It was just revolutionizing everything. So Um, I I did think it was going to be big though. I thought digital was going to be huge at that point. Before that, I was shooting mainly color slides, getting them processed, you know, uh, with color slides, you had about a a half a stop leeway, you know, to to get a decent exposure. Um, so digital was, it was pretty amazing. You know, I got one of the, the bubble iMac computers, you know, lime green. My son was just checking out that out the other day he pulled it up i said i had one of those (laughs) no way (laughs) so so that was kind of interesting um photoshop you know was still early early stages of that um but i started writing for this magazine it was called digital camera magazine so after a couple articles um they asked me if i wanted to be their uh staff adventure photographer slash writer um i'd never really written anything but uh i said i could I've always been a big proponent of that. Say say yes and then figure it out along the way. I think, yeah, a lot of uh, creatives do that <laughs> as well. <you> know? <laughs> it's kind of comes along with the, the territory where you just figure things out, you're problem solvers. So, so I, did, um, I did that. I started writing for them. And then after I got a couple articles under my belt, I decided to uh, propose a book. And I went through, it was uh, Am Photo Publishers at the time, and it was people like John Shaw, Joe McDonald, wildlife photographers that I was really looking up to. Um, and I, I put in this proposal, and it got to their desk, I think it was September 9th is when I mailed it, 2001. And I didn't hear back from them for a year, because 9-11 hit. Uh, so, and they were right in Manhattan. The publisher was right in Manhattan. Um, but then after a year they got back to me and they said, yeah, we'd like to, um, think about publishing your book. Can you send us three full chapters? So I was pretty excited, blown away. So I did that. And, uh, about another year after that, they published my, my book. So, um, that was great. And then I decided to go back to grad school. So then I I went back to grad school and got a, a master of fine arts and, Um, After that, I started uh, teaching a little bit, kind of adjunct teaching at the University of Delaware. I started doing study abroad programs. So I led a program to Tanzania. That went really well. And then the university asked me if I wanted to uh, lead a program to Antarctica. Um, At the time, I was still, you know, kind of uh, honing my skills at writing. And I said I wanted to go with a journalist. So they hooked me up with uh, Ralph Begleiter who was a CNN correspondent that recently had retired from uh, covering the, basically the Cold War was his main focus um, a lot in, in Russia in that region. And uh, together we, we led a photojournalism class to Antarctica and then we went back and did it again. 
And then um, since then, I've been all around the world uh, teaching students on these study abroad programs. I just did a, a program to Tanzania again. Um, and now I think uh, that's where I am here. You know, <laughs> I've done a lot of projects with indigenous groups throughout the years. So back in about 2005, I started working with the Hadza hunter gatherers in Tanzania, and that was with um, my safari guide that I had been with uh, when I went to Tanzania as a student in 1996. And that second time that I went, we met the Hadza, and uh, it was just a mind-blowing experience to to be in the bush with these people that have always lived as hunter-gatherers, and at that point, still majority of them were living strictly by hunting and gathering. And it just seemed like something had to be done. There was a, a lot of researchers that had been looking at the linguistics, um, looking at kind of their health and how they're managing that and what they're doing, their survival, their caloric intake. But no one at that point had really gone and, and asked them what their story was. So the goal of this project was a cultural mapping project. And we did a, a major expedition where we traveled around uh, for about three weeks and we went to all the areas that the Hadza, the elders had um, had memories of, but they had not had access to. So some of these elders were 60, 70, even up into the um, mid eighties that we took on this three week expedition. And we found um, their original home range, basically. And we, we kind of mapped it and did GPS coordinates and we we're connecting that to stories along the way. And we found out um, through all this mapping that they had lost about 94, 95% of their original home range. And now they're isolated just under this kind of one small section. Um, but we're, we're telling, having them tell the story of who they are. So we're really just acting as facilitators to help them um, tell that story. Um, it took a long time. So I, we started this project in 2005. We, we didn't publish a book until 2012. So it was about, you know, a, a solid seven year project. Uh, my wife did a bunch of the illustrations for that. And sometimes even that was a two or three year process where she would come with the uh, illustration. Obviously, you know, I, I wasn't in Tanzania the whole time, you know, it was just kind of a month here, a month there. And I would take it back and, and I remember um, all these grandmothers sitting around and they're like, no, it doesn't look like a Hadza. It feels like a Hadza. It was this oral history of Dudukwe and Dudukwe was a giant and um, he was eating these fruits and, and Dudukwe got drunk because all these fruits were fermented and he fell over and he peed. Uh, and his urine turned into Lake Yasi. So it was that oral story that carried through that connected them to this specific area, which is Lake Yasi, which was then um, some of the information that we used then to help them get uh, 50,000 hectares of land back from the government. So the Tanzanian government actually titled them 50,000 hectares of land. So now the Hads are able oh. to act as uh, patrol agents because they do have a title so they can kick out poachers they can kick out other people there's there's been a few scuffles but for the most part um, now they've got pretty good control and they're able to keep people out they're still really friendly to their neighbors and during hard times if the datoga need to come in and graze during the dry season the hadza do allow them to come and do that or they allow the Hadza to come and, and um, you know, give their livestock some some water from some of their wells. But then when things get better, they make sure that they kick the Datoga out again to make sure that it's their land and the people aren't uh, forming permanent settlements from that. So after that project finished in um, 2012, I, I was kind of hanging out at a party and a friend overheard me talking about the Hadza project and she said, you have to meet my uh, my friend Roger. So Roger and I had lunch, and about a month later, I was on a plane to Peru, and I was meeting the Sieha, which is another group of hunter gatherers in the Peruvian uh, Amazon rainforest. So it's kind of uh, right on the right on the edge of the Bolivian border. So it's kind of the gateway to the Amazon um, rainforest. And I met with them, and I kind of proposed the same general idea of this cultural mapping project with them. Uh, we met with all three different villages 
that are separated um, about 12 hours by boat. So the one is really accessible by land. So it's, it's kind of close to Puerto Maldonado. It's about an hour and a half away. The second one is about a four or five hour boat ride. And then the other one is it's about 12 and a half hours. So, you know, I'm thinking in Delaware here, how far can we get in 12 hours by car? Well, I think we can get to Maine. We can yeah, get you can definitely probably get to, to in Ottawa. Yeah, so yeah. it's far away and there's <laughs> nothing in between. You know, it's just a few little um, buildings along the way here and there. There's a yeah. patrol station from the Peruvian Bolivian government because once you take a, a right onto the Heath and Sineni River, You've got Bolivia on one side of the river and you've got Peru on the other side. And the river at some points might only be, you know, 20, 30 feet across. So it's not, it's not even a huge river at that point. Um, so, so I worked with them. Uh, we, I think I've been to Peru now 13 times since 2013 or 12 times, something like that. I lose track after a while, but um, really doing the same thing. So going in and acting as a facilitator to help them tell the story of who they are, um, capturing their conservation ethic, capturing their oral stories, their oral history, and having them share with um, the rest of the world what they want to share about their culture, also preserving their culture for their future generations. And anytime I talk about preservation of a culture, I don't mean like keeping them as hunter-gatherers, but preserving it in the, the best state that they can tell the story of who they, who they are and where they came from and their, their conservation ethic and all the oral history and all the um, things that go along with that. Yeah. So that, uh, that project is still kind of ongoing. Um, right now, the exhibit is in boxes in the Field Museum. So I think the last time we launched, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it was in the cool. freezer for Beautiful. twice as long as they wanted it to be. And then they pulled it out and then the museum, you know, went on lockdown. So uh, hopefully it'll open up in June, but we're not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I can say it's in the field, field museum. It's just not on the wall. <laughs> Technically in the... Yeah. It's there, yeah. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> so we were due to come down and film a piece with you. And that piece was actually going to be filmed uh, with the in Lenape territory. Yes. Um, so between that and Peru with the Seja and the Hadza, it's this, this theme underpinning a lot of your work um, from indigenous culture and indigenous knowledge is uh, what is it about the indigenous communities that kind of draws you to them to make art about them? Mm -hmm. um, it's so different when you're out in the, the forest or the, the swamps or the, the rivers with indigenous people. They just have a different way um, that they go about. And it's, uh, I think it's just a, a deep respect for the environment. And when you talk to any of the indigenous people and you start to get, you know, what is it that, that makes them the core, their beliefs, they're all so similar because they have some major, major connecting points where they only take exactly what they need. Uh, typically, if they have extra, they always share with their kin, their close family members or the, the neighbors. Um, they typically don't store a whole lot. Um, if anything, like if you talk to the Hadza, they, they can be up and gone, you know, um, even the Lenape Indian tribe in Delaware, you know, they've been assimilated for hundreds of years now, um, but they still have that environmental ethic. When I'm out walking around with Chief uh, Dennis Coker, you know, he stops in any big tree and, and the way he just puts his hand on a, a walnut tree, you feel it. You really feel that. Feel it. Yeah. You know, he's connecting in a way that most people aren't connecting. Why do you think um, we've lost it? And do you think it's starting to come back? Yeah, well, I mean, the hope is that it's going to come back. I think one of the reasons why we lost it is we came over to, you know, this country anyway. I can only speak in, in the um, facet of how I, I am, you know, and, and how I am as, as, you know, a descendant of these colonists that came in. Um, they had no knowledge of the land. They didn't have a tie to the land and they were trying to just mold the land 
so that they could survive, but they were doing it in a way that they knew how to do it back from their, their homeland, which was also taken from indigenous people, really. So it's been, you know, um, this knowledge hasn't been passed down from generation to generation, and that tie to the land was broken. And I think that's why we've lived the way we are and that we do save and save and save, and we try and accumulate more and more and more um, because we don't have that faith that the land is going to provide for us tomorrow. Almost like a safety yeah. net. Yeah, exactly. So that's our safety net where the indigenous people, they have that knowledge and they don't need that safety net. So they don't need to save um, enough or more. I mean, obviously some, some indigenous cultures, you know, are, are saving depending on the further north you get. Obviously you have to save more because winters and things like that are harsh. Um, but they're not going to save, you know, um, and accumulate this wealth that that we typically do in our in our culture. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things coming out of this lockdown, and um, just my wife and I driving around. Um, I don't know where we were going. I think it was a kid's birthday that we were just driving by and waving. But so many more people are just out and about now, walking, riding their bike. Um, enjoying nature, people I've are never walked are, so much in my life. Yeah, <laughs> right. Fifteen k a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, people are gardening again. You know, people are. Um, I saw friends of mine, you know, out collecting morels. They're posting stuff on Instagram. They're finding all these mushrooms, you know, that are edible, which is really cool. Um, and we're also seeing all these different cities around the world. You know, in certain town in India, they're able to see the Himalayas and they haven't seen the Himalayas for 30 years, you know? So there's all these really cool things that are emerging from that. And we have the technology, obviously. Like, I don't know where all you guys are are now. I'm sure we're all, where are you, Ben? You're in Canada right now? Yeah, Canada. Yeah, and how about you? Same, we're not that far apart. We're about an hour apart, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. But you know, we have this ability now to have this conversation and um, I think it's changed our faculty meetings totally. Like typically we would go in on a Friday and it would kill your whole Friday. You know, you got to get up and get dressed and drive in and all these people are wasting all this time and money. And now it's an hour long meeting instead. It used to be two and a half hours. We'll people don't sweat themselves. Themselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Don't look down. <laughs> yeah. No one's allowed to stand up for the next few, few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I think this is going to um, really change people in the way that um, we haven't seen or we haven't had that ability to change in a long time. Um, and I think it's probably going to change us in a, in a positive way. You know, um, I hope anyway. Got to look on the bright side. But I, there, there are a lot of bright moments. Obviously, you know, we're all missing that sh- social aspect. Um, it's just hard, you know, missing your friends and missing um, our, our kids, missing his friends, you know, and uh, he can only uh, use messenger kids so much. But um, but I do think it's a it's a much stronger connection to the environment that we're getting because all of this is happening. Even my friend in Wilmington, I talked to him, Wilmington, Delaware. He goes, man, I go outside now and you can see stars. He's like, we don't normally see stars in Wilmington. Like, that's awesome. It's really awesome. So. What's up from like lack of pollution or what? Yeah. Yeah. Less just haze. Yeah, yeah. Just the haze. Right. Mm-hmm. Cool. Obviously there's still light pollution, but, um, but there's not that haze that you would have. So the connection that we have with the land is kind of one thing that interests us the most about, about your work is because how can you, how can you portray something through your photography or through art in general that's so intangible our connection with our land with the trees with the with the food that we eat so how do you go about trying to tell that story Mm -hmm. um i think so much of it comes down to interacting with the the people and putting a face to the story um you know throughout time we're we've always been storytellers we've there's cave paintings that are, you know, what, 40,000 years old, you know? So we've always wanted to leave that mark and tell the story. Um, but for me to be able to connect a, a face to that, um, and and really I, what I try and do is capture the essence of someone. You know, I think all photographers do that. Um, and for me, it's a lot of listening first. So it's very rare that I ever go to it, go into a spot 
and take one photograph or, you know, um, I'm, I don't do a lot of just um, travel photography where I'm there like a week or something. I'm creating these long term, year long, if not more relationships with people going back over and over and over again. Um, if you're shooting, you know, um, in any sort of uh, more of a setup situation where you're using a larger format camera or something like that. Um, people break down after a while and you lose that just, you know, face for the camera and you start to get at who they really are. And, and if you're listening to them and you're hearing their story, um, the two of you are really making a portrait together. And then, you know, the, the other connections with the, the landscapes and everything, it's just me trying to figure out, um, what is most important to the landscape uh, for them and how do I try and capture that? So I'm trying to put myself in their shoes and trying to capture it in, in that sense. You know, I'll it's been really you. exciting working with the Lenape Indian tribe. Um, luckily, right before we went on lockdown, we had this massive cleanup. Um, and I think I, I told you guys there was only there's a half acre plot, quarter acre, half acre. We're not quite sure. We're still getting the uh, the actual perimeter mapped out. But we we had I think there were like 29 people that came out, community members, a couple people from the Sierra Club, a couple students from the University of Delaware, a couple just friends. And we did this massive cleanup. We pulled out, I think, 85 tires. <laughs> we oh. pulled out a full dumpster just full of just car parts. On a half acre. On a half acre. So people were just using it as a, a dumping ground. Um, we got a tree company in and we took down 30. It's a tree of heaven. I don't know if you guys get that up there, but it's a, a lanthus tree and it's an invasive tree. So we took down all of those, chipped them up. And um, Dennis, the, the chief, keeps sending me pictures. He goes, every time I drive by this spot now, there's a couple community members in there pulling up saplings. or mm -hmm. So it's, it's such an uplifting thing where they really are now taking um, ownership of this project. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no one's organizing it. They're just out there. He goes, yeah, I saw... Two guys just sitting there, you know, burning some of the some of the debris, the brush that uh, was from the tree of heaven, sitting around the fire on a rainy day. <laughs> that's so cool, you know. That's what we need to be doing during this time. Um, so we got a couple grants from that, and we had two students that just presented um, to some of the tribal council members their design ideas for um, reforesting, you know, replanting native plants. And it's going to be an edible forest using all the native plants and basically, you know, some of the nut trees that the Lenape would have had, some of the uh, medicinal plants, having tobacco in there as one of the sacred plants. And um, so that was pretty cool. And, and they, they each presented uh, three designs. So they presented six designs total. And then we went back and forth with the tribal council talking about what are the different elements that are uh, working best for them thinking about, you know, ADA accessible boardwalks so the elders could get down because it's a flooded forest. So yeah. it, it, it's for Delaware, it's a huge elevation change. It's about 10 feet or three meters, <laughs> <for this. laughs> which is amazing in Delaware because Delaware yeah. is really flat. But, we get altitude sickness in Delaware with that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, creating this kind of weaving serpentine pathway with then uh, like a circular overlook into the flooded forest down below um, is really cool. And, you know, thinking about all the different elements that make the Lenape the, who they are. Um, they don't like corners. They don't like angles. They don't like any squares. So everything has to be curve linear and circular and, and you know it goes cool along with it. yeah exactly so it's pretty cool what you can do with with design and if you really listen to who your client is because it really is a, a client-based project the design aspect of it it's like a lot of fun i'm just yeah. going to jump back to what you mentioned about the portraits and really getting into the community and getting to understand the people uh it reminded me of um a documentary I saw about Platon and how he takes a portrait. Mm -hmm. um, a big part of your Peru uh, exhibit is 
portraits on daguerreotypes. Mm -hmm. So could you explain what a daguerreotype is and why you chose that particular medium for the Peruvian project that you're doing? Yeah, you bet. So um, the daguerreotype was one of the first types of uh, photography ever developed. It was developed by Louis Daguerre. Um, Henry Fox Talbot and Daguerre were really simultaneously developing um, two different, totally different photographic processes. But Daguerre um, found out that if you have a copper plate and you coat it in silver and then you expose it uh, to iodine gas and bromine gas and then you expose it in a camera and then you expose it to uh, mercury gas, then you'll have an image that appears. And then down the line, they also figured out if you use gold chloride and blowtorch that onto the plate, then um, it hardens the image and it gives the image more contrast. So when we we're thinking about how to tell the story of the SEHA and how to capture some of the challenges that they were facing, um, we're, I was working with my colleague, Andrew uh, Bale from Dickinson College. We went to grad school together. Um, we we're just, you know, bouncing different ideas around and saying, you know, digital just isn't the right thing to do for this culture. It doesn't feel right to just shoot digitally. Um, it just didn't make sense. So we said, you know what, let's, um, let's take a workshop on daguerreotypes. So we went up to um, Rochester, New York, and we took a, a three-day workshop, just the two of us. And we actually made six daguerreotypes when we were there, just little ones, four, four by five. And then it took about another year and a half to come back and get that working in, in my studio back in Unionville, Pennsylvania. Um, but the reason why we chose that process is because the SEA ha are being affected by all the illegal gold mining in that area. And the gold that's found in that area, it's not like gold nuggets that you guys have up in Canada or Alaska. Um, it's, it's what's called alluvial gold. So it's these really tiny little flecks of gold. If you took a, a black pepper shaker and you put it out in your hand, that's how tiny these little flecks of gold are. So what they do in the Amazon, they get these massive water cannons. For, well, first they clear cut whatever area they want to mine. And then they get these water cannons and they just blast the soil and it just turns into a slurry. And then they put it on what's called a sluice box, which is this box on a slant. And they have what's called miner's moss, which is basically just like carpet. And all this soil is running over, um, this slurry of soil and water is running over that. They'll run it for you know a day or a week. And then at the end, they take these mats out and anything that's heavier is sinking into these mats. So gold is obviously heavy, so that sinks into the mat. But then also um, black sand is typically found with gold and this, this really heavy black sand is also in there. So they shake out these mats in these big 55 gallon drums and then they pour elemental mercury in there and they get in with their hands and their feet and they mix it up and the mercury binds to this alluvial gold and it forms an amalgam. And then with that amalgam, it's basically like a chunk and it's a chunk of mercury and gold all together. So then they burn off the mercury. Mercury then goes into the atmosphere and they're left with solid gold. So the mercury goes up in the atmosphere and then it's heavy. So it comes down on rain as like a thin film over the entire area. So the SEA had now don't eat any of the fish out of any of the large rivers um, they can't drink any of the water out of their um, normal streams and, and rivers that they normally would have. They're only able to drink out of underground springs because they know all of that um, water now and all that groundwater is polluted with mercury. The government estimates that in the Madre de Dios region alone, where the Sieja are, there's 38 tons of elemental mercury dumped in that environment every single year. And that number is continuing to go up even though um, the government's trying to combat that a lot. Um, it's a really difficult situation because you have a lot of the drug cartels now that are taking over the mining operations. So um, the SEA had don't mine either. So they're not, they're not miners. It's always people that are coming from the outside. Um, and if you talk to any of the miners, it's, it's always, you know, they don't want their kids to be miners. This isn't what they chose. They don't want to do this, but if they can make, um, $100 a month 
as opposed to $20 a month as a potato farmer and they're trying to give their kid a better life and put their kid through school and buy them um, school supplies and uniforms, things like that. You know, it's, it's the choice they're making. They're sacrificing their life so that their children can have a better life. Um, and we all buy gold. So around the world, you know, not only do our economies run on gold, but we have gold as status symbols, but now all of the electronics we use are also have a small amount of gold in them. So, you know, I'm guilty as well. I have a cell phone, I have a laptop, um, but we're really just trying to draw attention to that. So connecting the portraits um, that use mercury and gold in the actual process, we're trying to draw attention to that. Um, the the challenges that the SEA ha, are facing. In addition to the the um, daguerreotype has also been described as a mirror with a memory because when you first look at a daguerreotype, you see yourself because it's reflecting. So when I'm polishing these plates, I get this plate down to a mirror finish and it looks exactly like a mirror. In fact, most of the old uh, mirrors were silver. They would have silver on glass. Um, so you're seeing yourself first because we all are part of the problem. It's a global issue. It's it's not just, oh, those people in the Amazon shouldn't be mining that gold. Well, we shouldn't be buying that gold, you know, or we should be buying and investing in green technologies of gold where you can extract that. And there, there's plenty of um, ways to extract gold without using mercury, but it's what they know and it's cheap and it's easily accessible and readily available. Do you do that with like, do you try and do that with a lot of your projects? Do you try to yeah. focus on that sort of mm -hmm. more unique way? Context. Yeah, so um, my colleague Andy Bale and I are also uh, working on a project with refugees and immigrants and Native Americans in Idaho. Um, you wouldn't think of Idaho as being kind of a, a, a center for refugees, but it's it has been ever since the um, early 70s when a lot of people from Vietnam and Cambodia, Southeast Asia were coming over when the Khmer Rouge was in that region as well. And a lot of refugees were coming from there. Now you have a lot of refugees coming from the Congo and Syria. Um, and it's just, a, the Boise in itself is a really welcome, welcoming um, area for that. So um, once again, Andy and I were talking back and forth and we decided to use a eight by 10 film camera for all of those portraits that we're doing because that journey was so hard for everyone to get to. Um, once again, it didn't make sense to use that. And the same idea um, when you're capturing that portrait, it, it takes a long time to set up the camera. So, you know, it might take us 45 minutes to get everything just right. And at that point, people are no longer have their camera face on because you're having this dialogue and typically we're video recording them having a conversation while we're setting the camera up too. So we're hearing their story and we're figuring out, well, you know, what sort of pose would make sense? Do we want a full body? Do we want something closer up? Um, so that's definitely playing into it as well. You know, I haven't um, photographed, photographed a lot of the Lenape yet. I did photograph one young lady. <laughs> um, so I'm still I'm still working on that. You know, a lot of these communities, like I said, um, I don't just go in and photograph right away. So they're close to me. I know I can go anytime, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out what actual medium in photography. Will I photograph? And and maybe I won't. Maybe it's not a photo-based project. You know, maybe it's just a citizen science project um, that we're working on that we did get funded from uh, National Geographic for citizen science, not photography. But obviously, there's going to be storytelling involved. But it's it's hopefully probably more from their end and not from my end. Why do, why do you think art has a particular power or a particularly loud voice in addressing social or environmental? issues um because if you think about national geographic and their use of photography and think about the bbc developing the the nature documentary format as a as a tool for education or like chasing ice chasing coral with, mm -hmm. by uh jeff orlowski like incredible media for uh, showing environmental destruction or environmental solutions or just educating people about the natural world so what, what is it about art that can kind of 
differentiate the message compared to science or some other format? Um, I think art is so easily accessible for everyone. Um, it breaks down classes, socioeconomic barriers, language even. So you can, you can share an image with a Hadza hunter-gatherer in Tanzania or an Esieha in Peru um, or someone in the middle of Manhattan that's from an uh, affluent private school. And you could show them an image, someone um, like a Dorothea Lang image of the Great Depression. All of those people are going to understand what despair is going through the subject, right? The, the idea of struggle or hunger. So you don't need to speak the language. You don't need to be on the same playing level. You don't need to be um, on the same political affiliation. So it really is a universal language for me. And I think that's what's so exciting about art and photography and, and how you can connect with people and how you can create that social change. Um, it's impactful for sure. I was wondering if, do you think, why do you think it's so important to take a, take your photos sort of within that context you were mentioning before, because I, as the viewer, don't necessarily see the difference. So why is it so important to you? Or do you, do you think it conveys a message that maybe I'm not consciously picking up and I'm picking it up more subconsciously? Yeah. I mean, I, that's always the hope. Um, there's obviously different formats that people are consuming these images. Obviously we're consuming images online way more and a daguerreotype on your phone is going to look totally different than a, a dig, daguerreotype in person. Um, you will notice something different about it probably when you look at it, you know, it's going to have a, a different uh, kind of feel to it. But I do think that um, that message will transcend at some point, you know, to a deeper level and, and maybe not everyone will get the meaning and, and that's fine. I think, you know, you'll have the same thing if someone reads a book or watches a movie, not everyone's going to get the same exact meaning. But um, I think if you're looking for it and you open your eyes to it, you, you will get that meaning. Um, and it, it's just important for me with artist intent to make sure that I'm being true to my subject, true to myself, true to the, the project and the goals of the project. So you recently became the president of the ACO Foundation. And you're also a Nat Geo Explorer. Could you explain those those roles a little bit more and, and what you bring to those those two organizations? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's probably the worst time to be step into a new leadership role. You yeah, know. When did you start? January? I started in January, yeah. January 1. Um, and, of course, I was in uh, Tanzania for the whole month of January, so I didn't really do a whole lot with the new organization. It was still being taken care of by uh, Roger Mustalish. <laughs> and then we had a solid month. It was a great month. We launched a new website. We launched a new conservation fellows program. So I have um, nine conservation fellows where I have um, four full fellows, and they're mentoring five emerging fellows and the emerging fellows are you know young people that are just getting started uh, mostly in Peru and um, they are good with a camera or they're good storytellers but they need a little a little help to help you know uh, hone those skills so that's what the whole program's about um, the goal is that we're creating the next uh, cadre of conservation leaders of the future and I think starting with young people just makes the most sense even the full fellows are you know, 25, 26. So they're still really young, but yeah. they're, they're, you know, kind of top of the game, you know, they're, they're doing great things. They're um, working on Fulbrights and things like that. Um, so we're also, uh, we launched a new website. We're launching a new website in Spanish too. So we're translating all that. All of our field operations in Peru for the most part are shut down. Peru's on total lockdown. I don't know if you, even more so than a lot of other places. If you want to go to the grocery store, you need a permit. If you don't have a permit, you're getting pulled over. You can get fined. You can put it, get put in jail. Um, but one of our one of our staff members down there did have four cameras out, and he brought back these uh, camera traps. And we got some amazing footage. Right. Amazing, a jackarundi, which is this really rare 
cat. We got an ocelot. Uh, we got, oh, it was so cool to see nice. that. Um, uh, what does ACS stand for? Uh, um, Amazon Center for Environmental Education and Research. So the organization has been around for um, almost 30 years now. And um, we're hoping to hoping to keep it <laughs> keep it around. <laughs> I think we're going to make it through this time, but you know things are things are changing a bit. Um, one of the main goals too is uh, we're going to be starting this artist in residency program um, because just like we were talking about, you know, art has this capacity for social change. So I think including an artist residency with a um, classic conservation organization just makes a lot of sense and it's where my love and where my background comes in so i just talked to a young woman yesterday she's in rome um, she spent a lot of time in the madre de dios region and she does a lot of watercolors where she uses gold um, in the actual watercolors but gold that's been collected from that region and some of the other materials so same idea with the daguerreotypes but yeah. she had it in a, a whole other way. So we chatted for about an hour and a half. So I think uh, she might be the new artist in residence director <laughs> coming up soon. Yeah. And, you know, just being connected with National Geographic has been such a such an amazing experience. Um, the Explore community is so rich and connecting with different explorers around the, the globe has been great. Um, having that support from the organization, you know, I can call up any one of the the grants people and they'll give me feedback on certain things or just talk to them about different ideas. You know, when we were talking about the Lenape project, we got to talk to several, um, several people in the office before we even submitted anything. And they're like, yeah, this is, this is amazing. We had no idea, you know, there's an Indian tribe in Delaware. It's so close to DC. There's how many people? There's, you know, 750 to 1,000 people that self-identify as Lenape Indian. Um, and they've always been been there. They've just been hiding in plain sight for so many years. So I think, um, you know, that was one of the exciting elements where the project that we got funded for was the citizen science project where we're going to be ultimately seeding some of the tributaries with freshwater mussels that will be cleaning water up before it goes into the Delaware Bay. Um, and collecting all the oral stories and, and histories that they they have and uh, they still maintain, you know, they still have a, a sweat lodge leader and they still make the sweat lodge out of willow branches. And, you know, I haven't done it yet, but I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping I'll get an invite at some point. <laughs> what does it, what does it mean though, to be in a, like a national geographic explorer? Like what, what sort of steps do you go through or what is like, how do you get accepted? I guess. I mean, you don't apply. They just ask you they ask you and it's based on um based on your projects and based on what you're doing you know um there's a lot of explorers out there too and it's really like the year that you're accepted into a, a certain level of grants that they have they'll typically ask you um you know would you like to be named an explorer so it doesn't come with any any money or anything like that but it, you know it's a pretty cool title. <laughs> an honorary title. <laughs> yeah, but really to the, the resources that you have then available to you and, and kind of that network of people that you can bounce ideas around with. So I guess we'll start to wrap it up. My last question would be, um, you've mentioned a couple of times about, uh, especially with the, um, in the ACA Foundation, these uh, fellows and trying to get the next generation of storytellers out there. What, why, why are you dedicating so much of your time to trying to get the next generation involved and to tell these stories and be aware of these stories? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think so much of that changed when uh, I had a kid, you know? So typically I was, your kid? Uh, he's eight now. Okay. Yeah. He's eight. So, you know, typically uh, I was the storyteller and I, I had, I was the one that, had everything to say, and you know, even if I was sharing someone else's story. But now I think I'm in a in a great spot, you know, with the university um, and education that I really I really kind of want to pass that torch, knowing that you know I'm 45 now and I've I've hopefully made a, a difference, you know, in in what I've done throughout my life. And by by no means am I done telling stories, but I think it's really important to help cultivate that younger generation because they're the ones that are really going to make a difference. You know, the world that they've been handed is so different than the world that I grew up in. I learned how to type on an actual typewriter. You know, 
<laughs> um, shot film, you know, so these guys are all digital natives, but it's pretty cool how in tune the, the young kids are to the environment um, in all the different cultures that I visit, you know, um, they're just well-versed in everything. So they're well-versed in the digital world, well-versed in the environment world. Um, watching YouTube, these kids get so much information about the environment. I mean, we're out there, um, you know, I got bees today and my son is talking to me about the waggle dance of bees and how they communicate and things like that, which is, that's awesome. You know, I didn't know that when I was- You didn't learn that until you were 40. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and they retain stuff. So, you know, video is such a huge component now. Um, that's how these kids learn. And if, if we can automatically get them to be st storytellers and share that information, then more people are going to care, uh, I think. So ultimately, I think it's going to have a, a bigger impact on the environment, the more people that are out there telling stories yeah. in, in the proper way, in the, in the proper way, you know, and telling the right stories and um, being educated about those stories that they tell. And um, conservation based is, is really what I'm most interested in, conservation based with the indigenous perspective as well yeah everyone is so hooked into storytelling already too right like you know the whole idea of social media is telling a story mm -hmm. so it seems like now it's just okay can we get them to tell the right story and in the right way right mm -hmm. exactly well it's definitely something we're trying to do joe and i are trying to do with the um one tree planted with the videos that we're producing um mm -hmm. and yeah it's kind of trying to find that right balance of like simplifying the story or giving it that human element, but also not dumbing it down. And right. you've got to find that balance. Um, mm -hmm. because said, kids, kids are a lot smarter than you realize. Like to comprehend the wiggle dance at age five or however old your kid was yeah. when you learned that is, yeah, kids are smarter than you think. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, kids are definitely smart. No, and I think um, that's why I, I was so interested in your organization because you guys do have such a, simple model it's so easy to grab onto oh if i do this you'll plant one tree <laughs> it's like, yeah. and then what does that one tree do for the environment you know it's so impactful so impactful um yeah yeah, well, yeah matt, matt the ceo of one tree planted says it all the time like keep it simple mm -hmm. and like he really doesn't want to deviate from the model yeah. because one dollar one tree and yeah it's easy yeah. to communicate. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. No, that's great. Cool. So what are you guys questions? doing during this time? <laughs> Gosh. Walking the dog. Yeah. <laughs> Watching Obviously, Netflix. you guys aren't planting many trees right now, right? <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you, um, did you see the episode on Netflix of Dirty Money about gold mining in Peru? No, I didn't see that. I heard about yeah. it, though. I got to check that out. Yeah. Film. It's yeah, by a you guy see called all the Stanley. you see them using the mercury too in that I think right yeah yeah you yeah, see the yeah. whole process yeah. um, and just like the narrative uh, device that he's used he gets like a, a young uh, Peruvian girl a young mm -hmm. indigenous girl to give this kind of like story as if she's Earth as the narrative device yeah stunning from a, that, that just came across Instagram today I think where they're releasing it for two weeks for free for people to do you have a netflix account yeah i do i do but they were yeah. doing it some other way okay. but, all, yeah. they're doing a whole bunch of things where it's like a lot of netflix stuff is popping up on youtube for yeah. free yeah. that's what it was yeah, yeah. It was pop up on YouTube. But yeah you got to check it out because it's, yeah i will definitely it, what's the name of that big mine as well La, oh um the one that you fly over on the way yeah, to yeah 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 i mean there's so many of those though that's the thing you yeah. know you um, see people doing the process that you described and it's exactly yeah, just a stunning film. Really mm -hmm. nice film. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, hopefully, hopefully, some of those areas are totally abandoned soon once they get all the gold out, and then you know it would be possible to go in and do some reclamation work. Yeah, it, you know. Well, a big part of that film is just highlighting, as you said, uh, once the like, once the gangsters get involved, once the cartel gets involved. Mm -hmm. it's, they're using the gold as a means of laundering money from drug sales in the US. So the money can be transferred and then they buy gold, sell gold. I know. And it's been laundered. 
Yeah. So the, the problem isn't just environmental, as you said, it's, it's economic and there's gangs involved and it's, it's, it's always a far much more complex issue than, than you think it is. It's never just simply environmental. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's, you know, so much is based around humanitarian too, because you've got all these mining camps now that are taking um, indigenous people or, or young girls from town and creating these sex slave, you know, basically situations where there's no way for them to get out. Um, so that's obviously horrible. And then you also have all the poaching for all the meat um, in the area because it's cheap. So yeah, it's terrible. It's just terrible. So and so much of it is because of, it's because of our need or our need or want for drugs on this side of the equator kind of right. And then, yeah. And then they're just, exactly they're the ones suffering through it. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's all based on people that have more and just wanting more. And and that's what's fueling all of all of the destruction in these these areas. You know, back um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even the price of gold was low enough that it wasn't worth it to go into these areas and mine that. But now with the price of gold being, what is it now, $1,600 an ounce, you know, um, now it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth so it. So let's just finish on a positive note then. What yeah. uh, keep it short and sweet. What what gives you hope that you've seen over the last couple of years? What gives you hope? Uh the kids. The kids give me the hope, you know. Um going down to Peru, I was in this bio blitz and seeing the kids' excitement, using technology, using uh programs like iNaturalist to identify things and share things back and forth. So they're being storytellers right now. The Lenape youth are doing the same thing. Um, the Sieha youth, we did a photo voice project with them and their excitement surrounding the camera and sharing their own story. So for me, um, they're going to continue to share these stories if we give them the right tools and we encourage them and teach them best practices. So uh, I think it's, it's the kids. It's the kids that uh, keep me going on all this, for sure. Awesome. Well, <laughs> yeah. thanks so much for taking the time today, John. Yeah, you bet. Was a Sorry, I was a bit late. It was, a, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> just, just Everyone's like, lost track of time these days. To, anyway, to, uh, what day it is, what time it is. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. No, it was great chatting with you guys. And hopefully uh, hopefully, we can do something in person at some point. <laughs> for sure. Thanks for watching the house. Yeah, awesome. All right, guys, <laughs> take care. Great chatting again, take John. care. <laughs> you bet. Bye.